were the songs, were they all new songs, or were they some some ideas that you had before and you added to, or? Uh, the ideas were kind of germinating, and I had, you know, I write down, I've been writing, uh, you know, lines and ideas, and some names and titles, and even band names I would write down, and yeah. in, uh, you know, my books, writing books, and, uh, but the, the, when I finally gave life to these songs, it was, it was after I started, I played a show last July 1st, Canada Day, actually in Vancouver, to get some gas money to get home to Alberta, and uh, we played, well, that's, it comes up again, but uh, I, I just went home and started, I just kept on playing the guitar, I said, I'm going to do this, do another show, maybe, and uh, it didn't happen until October, but we went back and played it, showed it twice as many people, for like 400, and then uh, it's been going on since then, and got the recording happening to the good graces of my friend Laurie Matheson in Calgary. He was the only person I knew there, right? So I phoned him up and the guy knows everybody in the Calgary underground. So, so we got some musicians uh, and, uh, and got their songs together. I forgot your original question. Um, but but uh, the songs themselves I worked on for a good year just kept on playing it I thought, I thought god damn this is so if I thought it was cheesy or too preachy I'd keep on playing it usually I would stop playing in the past but this time I kept on playing the damn thing until I until I got got through the through the um, maybe say polemical nature of one part of the song into something more uh, um, universal, timeless sound as far as the lyric goes, you know? Well, absolutely. And there's like a major political theme to your record. And I was going to ask, was it, was it the fact that you felt like you needed to say something um, about what's going on in the world? Is that more or less what what kind of drove you to do the new record or was it just like a decision like like you said you played a gig did you just make a decision like i, I want to play more and then this kind of pushed you no, it's through my through my reading uh, that i decided uh the crunch was this amazing book called death and the Dervish, and it's how you overcome the cowardice in the face of immense a faceless power and you feel so powerless and I'm just like what can I do and uh, I just uh, decided to pretend, pretend not to be a coward and say what I think exactly what I felt about things through what I had learned through my research I guess you could call it what the human condition and why we do this awful shit to each other and the whole planet really well, I don't. I don't feel like your your music has ever been cowardly at all. I feel like you've been very honest, and you know, I just feel like maybe um, compared to your old stuff with this new album, um, your old stuff was more. You wrote a lot of it when you were out and about and in public and you know around people and stuff. Yeah, more of it's stories of uh, of people. And this, yeah, and this sort of, yeah. Uh, stories of people that I knew and hung out with and about myself and my interactions at, at the lower end of our society, shall we say. And uh, But this is more of an overview of why people are down there and end up there and why there's so many of us on the younger, the, the younger class, they call it. It's just less like become a real dichotomy in the world, right? The rich north and the rich south, and even in the north we are, I mean, there's a huge class of people that don't even get paid enough to, as they work, to even have a sustainable life. Right? No, totally. The reason, the reason is this brutal system that People don't think it's real because they're not clumped over their head, but it's just everywhere on everything. On, I mean, it's just like a huge 
this um, glowing billboard that makes that makes people think they want they need to have or want all this crap they don't need or want really yeah well I, I, I caught that from the song um, the company store that's kind of what you're saying in that one like, yeah, we've all been made. People buy, they buy stuff for the label on it, and it's it's just crazy. And the whole the whole uh, concept of branding that's been said to me is like, um, we've got to get your brand up there. I don't have a brand. My name is me. It's, it's the name my parents gave me. It's kind of a slave name, I guess, in that regard. But um, and it's something you burn into an animal's skin. Yeah. It's a whole other story. But, uh, but, but branding, I mean, they burn it into your consciousness. And they do it by studying uh, human behavior. And, uh, and it's been done since the First World War, actually. You can make people do shit they don't really need or want to do. I have this relentless uh, GR advertising, uh, whatever you want to call it, subliminal, you know, messages. Yeah, like Kubrick stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you find yourself channeling people a lot when you write or perform? Do you find yourself channeling a lot? Because I got a lot of vibes, like, especially after the new record, like the Drones of Democracy, I felt a huge, like, Neil Young guitar vibe on that one. Uh, well, definitely, he's inspiration for that song. Uh, um, if you want to quote the Star article, which I ever gotten shit for, it sounds like I stole the song. But no, I wanted a song as powerful as as Cortez, because that song makes me weep, and I wanted. To, and uh, I had the idea of, for Jones, and I so I worked through the music and the lyrics for about a year until I got it right, and then. Yeah. Uh, the guy came in who was an incredible guitar player to make it sound like that. And of course, the end is just kind of uh, like a saucer full of secrets or something. Yeah, I got a, I got a big Beatles vibe. Oh, for sure. Yeah, he's. Are they, were the Beatles? Were, tell me about. Tell me about how important the Beatles were for you. Well, huge. At the time, you know, what was I ten? when they came exploding out of the uh, UK. So did my they... Old did they... My whole generation watched those shows on itself, and I mean, it was, those songs just uh, burned in, and then, you know, once you're a fan, you just move along with them to what they, what they experimented with and everything, the culture, the zeitgeist, whatever, but, you know, I moved through it, and then... I don't know what happened in the early 70s, but after Bowie, kind of nothing happened, really. You got this swirling, awful arena rock crap of Eagles, um, Fleetwood Mac and all that shite, Steve Miller. Ugh. And then, hope, thank God, uh, the Pistols came out and uh, showed me what can be done. I combined all my musical knowledge then and then kind of unlearned everything and made it all new again. Yeah, I read that somewhere where, um, I read that blurb on the Young Canadians album, and it said that the Pistols were a huge influence on you. What about them did you like so much? And what, you know, like, how did how did it change you? Hearing well, well, just uh, the nugget of the idea that you can combine your your personal politics and your artistry to make a statement and you don't have to feel embarrassed or self-conscious about it. You can just get up there and do it, perform and transform yourself and the people around you by like living, living, really living it, living it up, living it up and realizing that you're going to die and you should be that way for the rest of your life. 
Very cool. Sounds like sounds like a conversion almost, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I know. Uh, to the to the punk Catholic, of course. John Lydon famously said, "There used to be more bands like us." He didn't mean clones. He meant more of the. Well, he he, he was the spark really. Him and and Malcolm added on. Malcolm McLaren added on all the political shit, but. Um, it came from actually a guy in the 50s in France named Guy de Ford who started the group called the Situation International, which said you should go out and just cruise the city and find find life and action by going down the wrong way, the wrong street, and just, you know. They, they had graffiti in the 50s in Paris that said never work. <laughs> see it and actually I was really influenced by the book uh, Lipstick Traces who by Grail Marcus actually turned me into an arsonist for a while <laughs> so before then though you you hadn't heard like any of the stuff coming out of New York or anything like the Ramones or anything like that you oh had... yeah I was uh, we were I had a friend who turned me on to the Dolls and Stooges huge uh, Iggy fan and became 75 to 76 and then uh, it all in, into a more ferocious entity. We were really, really turned on by that, that kind of attack. Well, there, you like to, you like attack to the audience to to challenge them, right? Right. Them. Uh, I've never found that in Canada, unfortunately. I don't even consider myself a Canadian citizen, really. <laughs> Well, you are a Canadian citizen, and yeah. we're proud of you, man. Like, you're, you know, when I explain you to people, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you, you're you like the Canadian Lou Reed, you know? You are the, you know, that's... Thank you very much. There's another big influence. I the Velvet. Oh, wow. And then, uh, then on through, you know, up through the replacements. I'm a huge Paul Westerberg fan, too. You might have noticed... And I was writing, I was writing a review of the record last night because I'm doing a few articles. Like I'm doing this interview. I'm coming tonight. I'm going to do a review of the show. I'm writing a That's review, fantastic. review the record. Like whatever I can do, art. Honestly, I'm a huge fan of yours. And you know, uh, from the moment I I discovered you because of Hardcore Logo is how I discovered you. Oh really? And I was young oh. when that movie came out. You know, I was about nine or ten years old. That was a great movie. Great script. Absolutely. Uh, are you are you going to do any more movies, or are you, you don't really want to do that, or? No, I'm not. I, it's my own brand of thing. I start acting when I wake up. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, no, no, I'm not an actor. I can't. I can't be someone else. I just. Uh, I mean, I, and I've met that, and that uh, people actually sent me to auditions for fucking ads. I couldn't believe it. It's, everyone's so flaky around that industry. It, you know, it's just... Uh, so no. Maybe a Lawrence from Trier movie or another Bruce McDonald movie, but uh, or I could just, you know, be myself. Oh, no, for sure. Well, yeah, I know. I mean, you played yourself in Hardcore Logo and you were Otto in, in uh, Highway 61, right? Yeah. So, um, are, you a, are you a big Bob Dylan fan? Yeah, I'm huge, yeah. Cause that I, too, man. Yeah, well, the Bob Dylan of 1965, 66. Yeah, like blonde on blonde, blood, blood um, Highway 61 kind of era. Oh, for sure, yeah. The other day, uh, station in Calgary, they put they played Maggie's Farm, and then they played the company store, and I was really pleased that they sat beside each other so well, right? It's, it's just uh, kind of a continuation I'm, I'm trying to do of a kind of thing with making it to date lyrically right well yeah that's the that's the vibe I got off company store I felt like a huge like mid 60s Dylan kind of fuck you kind yeah, of vibe yeah, it you wasn't know? meant to be but I didn't know how it would turn out at first I just bashed it just me and an, and an electric guitar but uh, 
got kind of boring after five minutes. So to add some, add some, uh, some, uh, what's it called? Some Appalachia to it. Yeah. No, well, totally. I mean, I don't mean that as an insult. Like, that's, you know, if I... If you no, could get... it's definitely there. It's definitely an influence, so, you know, why deny it? I mean... Absolutely. I've done this all since the, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It's always been an undercurrent. It's like reading the People's History of the United States, which I did, and the guy lists, uh, Howard Zinn lists all the rebellions you never heard of, all the workers that were shot, all the families that were murdered and burnt, uh, trying to be in a union to get a decent wage. And um, it's um, been there all along, and he lists all the slave rebellions and the fact that the United States was an empire from the word go. Or an empire making entity. Absolutely. And the destruction of and genocidal impulse to, you know, to kill all the buffalo first and then that, in that way eradicating the aboriginal population of the continent. I mean, That's why I feel weird about being a Canadian because we're, we're just another. You know, colonial construct, part of the British Empire, built across, and uh, let's look at the uh, Louis Rail story, or what happened to the planes. Well, every every native in in this country. So, what? When was the moment that you decided, "Fuck it, I'm going to be a musician. I'm going to be a songwriter." This is what I'm going to do. When, when was that moment? Do you remember when that exact moment happened to you? Um, well, never. You mean in the recent past? or No, just in the, in the first place. When you... In the first place. In the first uh, place. What was it that, you know, was it the Beatles? Was it, You know, what was it that you saw, heard, or felt that made you... Oh, I got my older brothers. They were all musicians. They came out of the, the 50s scene, right? Rock and roll. You know, I had greased back hair, and they were, you know, playing out with Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, and that was my first uh, exposure to the, the shiny thing called rock and roll. And so <laughs> I used to grease back our hair when we were like six years old and put sunglasses on us. It was funny. But, uh, but uh, I was probably in the 60s when I was 12, 13. Uh, one of my brothers showed me how to play a couple of Stones songs, and... And I just kept learning how to play from that point on. And I didn't really know what I was doing, I don't think, until, uh, until Punk came along. I was just kind of undirected, misdirected, just uh, didn't know how to say, how to taste stuff, really, how to cut it to the nub, right? Yeah. Until that point. So that was the big point, I think, 76, 77. So punk really made you feel comfortable doing it, and yeah, I was comfortable with who I am as a speaker, and not to not to not to um, dilute your message with you know, don't beat around the bush. Fucking say it, say what you want to say, brutal honesty, and uh, like Louis, like I, and then what a novelist would do, what a novelist would do, like Hubert Selby or something. If they can write it in novels, why can't we say it in songs, right? No, absolutely. Um, what was the worst nine to five job you ever had? Oh, no. It's been a few. Quit them all. <laughs> I guess I'm working on a pig farm, a chicken farm, loading box cars. Seems that the laboring jobs got harder and harder. Just five years ago, I was roofing until I was so injured I couldn't do it anymore. It just got, it was a brutal job, man. Oh. Yeah. Um, and eventually I found uh, the government system and took advantage of that. So, you know, I looked at it as an artistic grant. In the city, we don't go on welfare, but that, that never gives you enough. It just kind of barely <coughs> throw it into the ranch or whatever. And then uh, add under the counter jobs after that. 
Did you see what uh, Biff Naked's doing? Yes, that's great. So that, that kind of, yeah, that kind of like pushes that point as to like it's not enough money that the government gives to people who yeah. legislated poverty. Yeah. Um, what was the favorite gig that you can remember that you played in your life? What was your favorite gig? Uh. Probably playing with Midnight Oil at UBC Thunderbird Stadium. That was a good one. You know, 10,000 people. That's always nice. Oh, yeah. And the roar of a crowd like that is all mm-hmm. also always inspiring. It was great because afterwards I hitchhiked out of there. <laughs> <laughs> I had an easy time getting a ride that night. Um, another one, oh, the shows with way back and when we did a tour with them. k did, our uh, young Canadians. And those guys, such incredible musicians every night. And it's just, it really inspired my music as well. Very cool. So, I mean, uh-huh. as far as all the bands you've played with, you'd say that like Midnight Oil and XTC were tops for you? Um, that I played with? Yeah. Um, um, I mean, there's so many great, great bands. So, but uh, uh, those are memorable as far as influencing me as a musician and, and the, the great audiences that were there. Cool. Um, what was the worst gig you ever played that you remember? Well, actually, another great one was like from six people at the Hong Kong Cafe. In Los Angeles, probably the best show, one of the best shows I ever played in my life, but only six people there. But the worst, worst was, and also the best was, I played a restaurant in Kensington Market, and the only person there was my, my wife, Sherry. She said, you played the whole night for me, it was great. The old K-Market. They, they tried to turn it into um, a Loblaws a couple of years ago, but we stopped that. That's good. Stop that. Yeah, we stopped it. The town I lived in, live in now is just nothing but chains, stores, and box stores. Gotta walk a mile to get a, a carton of milk or whatever. Yeah, they've really, they've really, they're really trying to push out like local business, and the American businesses are really moving in, eh? Uh-huh. Canada yeah. Limited, <laughs> as usual. Um, what it, what's what's your favorite concert that you ever saw? Oh God! Is that a Gang of Four, Commodore, another awesome band, Gang of Four. Yeah, uh, it's just Little Fingers, same place. Um, the Clash, same place. Bastards still all our girlfriends. <laughs> I heard they crashed, I read somewhere they crashed at your house or something, the class? Yeah, they came to a party at our house, to our girlfriend, and gave them drugs. Oh. Huh. Those amazing left-wingers, the class. Did you like Joe Strummer a lot, or? Oh, I didn't get a chance to really talk to him, but, but yeah, he's a big hero. Definitely. Well, he, yeah, he's, uh, I mean, people credit the, the pistols, but... They, they definitely oh kicked, kicked it off, but The Clash really took it home, I think. Yeah, you know, for sure. Yeah, great songs. Um, I love that song. Um, I don't know if it's the one about control, complete control. Complete control, remote control. Um, what was the worst concert you ever saw? Like, you just saw this band and you're just like, fuck, this is shit, I'm leaving. Like, oh, it was probably Led Zeppelin in uh, 70. For, but it wasn't. It was Robert Plant was sick. He couldn't sing, so it was pointless. Um, and of course, uh, a Bob Dylan show was pretty, pretty bad. Only in the nineties, I think. Um, in your opinion, what is the greatest song ever recorded? Oh God, there's so many. Huh? 
can't limit it that way, I don't think. Your top five, what do you what would you say? Uh, top few. I don't even think that way, you know? I don't even think the best or anything. I, 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 I can't answer that. I have no idea. Um, Alex Shelton. <laughs> <laughs> the song Alex Shelton. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Are you a are you a big fan of Big Star as well or? Uh -huh. A big star. Big star, yeah, 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 yeah. Thirteen. An awesome song. Um. Oh, uh, only ones. Another girl, another planet. Or the Who won't get fooled again. Or geez, you know, there's so many great songs. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, I just mean like. You know, Desert Island, End of the World, last song you'll ever hear, what would it be? Um, Dulé Brothers, David Bowie. <laughs> cool. So you're a big Bowie fan then, huh? Oh, yeah. Do you like, um, are you bigger on the, uh, like, Ronson stuff, or the later experimental stuff, or what? Do you, what is oh, um, well, the huge, uh, the experimental stuff, the low Found. Yeah, low's cool. Heroes low. That era. Yeah. Um, what would your. Well, so, Hunky Dory is one of the greatest albums. Also, another band that you probably don't even know about, Circle C, copyright, out of Vancouver, did several, two or three absolute masterpieces albums. Circle C? Circle C, copyright. Oh, cool. I'll check them check out. Check them out. I will. Um, amazing, amazing songs. Well, amazing lyricist. Oh, another amazing uh, album. Huge, best poet ever in music. Tom Verlaine, television. Oh, yeah. Uh, Marquee Moon album, are you talking about? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're Beautiful. great. Beautiful. Yeah. That, that album is ahead of its time. And I mean, they, they were the first band to play at CBGB's, right? At where? At CBGB's. Oh, yeah, maybe. Well, uh, Patty Smith that, that year. The Ramones said that they walked into CBGB's the first time ever and heard television. That was the first band they ever saw there. So, really? Yeah. They said that they walked in. Well, Dee Dee Ramone said that, and then v, they were playing Venus. Venus de Milo, that song? Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, so... I think television is so underrated. I think the guitaring on that album is amazing. The drumming is amazing. Like Tom Verlaine is his lyrics and vocals are amazing. Like it is. Yeah. So underrated. Yeah. Um well, not, uh, yeah. It's just great. Well, underrated to the public, you know what I mean? Not to guys like us who actually like listen to music, but Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's just uh, un uh, unrecognized. Um, what if you had any advice to give to you know younger musicians just starting out? What would it be? Don't do it. <laughs> really? Make stencils. Be, do Banksy. Banksy it. Um, I mean, unless you're like I've met in my travels and lately I've been playing with some of the best musicians. In Canada, if not the world, and um, it's on inspiring. These guys are so into music, and they know all the ins and outs, and how to write it. And they're multi instrumentalists, and you are too. So um, it's just uh, it's a really pleasure to play with them. But I, I just can't go down the, the shop talk road talking about amps and guitars and stuff. And that's not my scene. So I'm going to, if I had to do all over again, I would uh, probably do a Che Guevara thing. What was it like working with John Cale? It was awful. Gotta, just gotta say, it was awful. Awful? Because maybe it was my band at the time, I don't know. It was just, uh, he wasn't interested. He was there for the money, and uh, I don't know. We should have been playing new songs. We were recording and making songs that are already been recorded sound worse uh, without life. I don't know. Was that hurt? Like, was it hurtful to work with? Like, I know you're a big Velvet Underground fan. Was yeah. it hurtful to you to work with someone that you respected for so long and 
they turned out it turned out to not be so good like as far as yeah, the work I was in my own stupid addiction world and uh, I just didn't care enough to fight for the music and that's uh, you should never do that I was intimidated hmm. I was self intimidated well I like to say that album is still turned out really good in my opinion and actually, yeah. I listened to that one last night, too. I saw that you covered a Graham Parsons song. Um, are you big on, like, Flying Burrito Brothers and Graham Parsons? Or? Totally. I heard that when I was, what, 16, and I saw Graham Parsons in North of Vancouver, long, 69. And, uh, and he calmed out, chilled out a whole crowd of nutsoid, acid-headed Bikers and, and everyone else uh, for the time he played. This beautiful, angelic. So he, he changed music himself. Did you see him with, like, was he with the Burrito Brothers or was he with. Yeah, yeah, it was the Burrito Brothers, yeah. That's Chris crazy. Hillman, uh, Chris Etheridge. Sneaky Pete. Yeah, Sneaky Pete, wow. Cly now. That, that that's, another, that's another whole scene, uh, the birds, the Wiener Brothers, that kind of country, and I like all the great, all weird country, I like Wilco, all that scene, I'm on a, I'm really influenced by that stuff too. Cool. Um, so other than reading, do you have any like hobbies that you do, like painting or anything like that? Or? Uh, no, I don't paint. Yeah, just, just just trying to keep enough life in me to get some more songs done. So yeah, I read you're planning on doing another record, so you're gonna do another record, right? Uh, at least one more, yeah. Good. I'm gonna record some more songs, yeah. Very nice. Um, do you still have the '61 Strat that is unplayable by everyone else except you? Oh no, I got stolen shortly. Yeah. I got I had a bass guitar in my car with all my harmonicas and it got stolen out of my car. So that I know how that feels. It sucks. Um, so so when you when you when you played with the Boomtown Rats, wh what was that like? Like when you're young and you're all of a sudden you're on tour with Bob Geldof. Like what what is that like? You know, for for a kid who's just oh, Bob of, was civil. He's nice. Um, bit pompous on stage and. Guitar players were just hacks and they were assholes. So, you know, I had the pleasure of uh, pissing on them from the heights of the Northlands Coliseum. <laughs> Actually, look at, I told Sam Sutherland this, he wrote that book, Perfect Youth, about early uh, scenes in Canada. And I got a little chapter in there, and he describes it very well. He said, a light mist fell over the that's hilarious wow man well um i mean that's it that's basically it for all the questions i had um is there anything you want to add like, no uh, uh, that's really great matt that you're so interested well absolutely honestly i'm a huge fan of yours and it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time for me.